Uh, so, looking through the Psalms, we've got to Psalm 5. Only 145 more to go. Um, when asked to describe what type of book Psalms is, what type of literature, what genre the book of Psalms is, the usual answer is kind of, it's poetry. In the current preaching program, we've referred to the Psalms as a remarkable collection of very different ancient songs. It's, it's like a hymn book for the Bible. But I think the Psalms are just much more than that. They're not just a book of prayers or hymns or psalms to be sung or read fervently and graciously and reverently in church. They are such a wonderful tool for encountering God in worship and in our everyday lives. It's in the Bible, the God-inspired Holy Bible, that we encounter God most readily. The Psalms are some of the most descriptive parts of the Bible for telling us about God. They're written by people who opened up their hearts to tell us of the amazing things God has done. They are prayers to God in times of trouble, cries for help, and they're honest accounts of acknowledging our failings and forgiveness and seeking forgiveness and reconciliation with God. Psalm 5 is like one of many psalms in the Bible. It's a prayer, a solemn address to God at a time when the author, who is David, was in great distress due to his enemies. And this was a situation that David found himself in at many points of his life, and that's reflected in many of the psalms David wrote. The result being that you know, there was this recurring theme through many of them of being in distress and calling out to God for help. But it doesn't mean that there isn't still plenty to learn just from this individual particular psalm, and which can still be a challenge to us today. Uh, the psalm starts off as a cry of lament, petitioning God to hear, to listen, and to help. But it's not, it's not a whine of David. It's not David going, why is this happening to me? Nor is it a demand of going, God, do something now. No, the psalm, it's, it's not a wallowing of lament of depression either, which some of the psalms can sound like. You know, they really do go in depth into feelings of despair, hopelessness, desolation. You know, goth psalms, you might want to call them. Uh, and Psalm 6, actually, which we're looking at in a couple of weeks' time, which Katie will be um, taking us through, uh, is a classic example of one of those psalms where the, the author really does go into vivid description about how bad they're feeling. Uh, interestingly, actually, the introduction to this psalm says, For the director of music, for pipes, a psalm of David. Uh, I was wondering if I could set, you know, not necessarily the talk, but perhaps the reading to music. Um, as instructed. Uh, we did away with our old pipe organ when we refurbished the church, uh, but I thought maybe, you know, if we're looking for pipes, maybe some good old like, fashioned bagpipes could have been great as Chris was doing the reading, just adding to the sense of angst and despair as they wail across it. Uh, but no, that's not really what the psalm is about. No, this is a cry for help, but straight away there is something striking and important about the way David speaks through this psalm. Um, he begins his psalm uh, thus, uh, it says this, Listen to my words, Lord, consider my lament, hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. David calls on God to listen to his cry, but he acknowledges who God is straight away, he says, God, you are my king, my God. And in doing so, David gives us the model for how to bring our suffering before God in prayer. He doesn't whine or demand answers or response immediately like an impatient child. David knows who he's talking to and gives the honour and respect that is due. How David delivers this petition to God is also a really great example. 
He gets up in the morning and he's still got his problems in his life. So the first thing he does is talk to God to bring his problems to him. He says, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests out before you and wait expectantly. Some of us may find that when we hit kind of low points in our life, as inevitably the cycles of highs and lows in our life go, the hardest thing can sometimes be to just bother to get up in the morning and deal with the world. To think about having to deal with the world that seems to be causing us nothing but grief and angst. It's just easier to stay where we are, not face the world and our problems. Because at least we can't exacerbate them if we don't do anything beyond staying in this perceived comfort of our bed, our sofa, or lounging around. But David doesn't do that. He doesn't give in to this desire to wallow. He says, in the morning, I lay my request before you, and I wait. He doesn't ignore what's going wrong, but he doesn't demand an instant response, an instant relief to his problems either. I wait, he says. And it's in the waiting that we can allow ourselves time to think more on God, to talk more to God, to listen and meditate on him and his word. When we have things in our life that are worrying and troubling us, one of the best things I think we can do is just to make a list of those things. And then take a look at your list and ask yourself, are any of these people or events under my control? If so, what can I do to change them? And if you can change them, you do that and you get these things crossed off your list. And if you can't do anything yourself about them, then these are the things we can give to God. No one ever changed anything simply by worrying about it. And here David takes this decisive action to deal with what's causing him worry and trouble. So far, so good. Brilliant. But then we come to the cause of David's lament. People. Or more precisely, people who are trying to harm him. His enemies. He says, for you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and deceitful you, Lord, detest. So often, this is what fills David's psalms of laments, his prayers, his petitions to God for help. It becomes almost kind of like a mini discourse on the righteous versus the wicked. Those whom God favours and those whom he despises. And when I first read this psalm in preparation for this talk, I found myself having a bit of a problem with those words. David often writes in the psalms about how terrible his enemies are and how God will punish them whilst rewarding the righteous. And he seems to kind of regard himself as part of that latter group here. Yet with the knowledge of what's still to come in David's life, we know that he is far from righteous himself and engages later on in life in absolutely terrible behaviour, murder, adultery. And so reading these words here in the light of what we know is still to come in David's life, it feels like a bit of a pious, judgmental diatribe, completely lacking in self-awareness. You know, see how bad these people are, but at least I'm not like them. You know, that's not to say David's words aren't valid. God is not pleased with wickedness. And in this world, there is so much of it. David implores God to judge the wicked accordingly and impose the just judgment. At this stage, David, I think, sees himself as opposite of the wicked. He's one of the righteous. And reading through this psalm, I found myself thinking how dreadfully hypocritical and blind to his own faults David is. Yet, of course, later on in his life, later on in the Psalms, we find David does actually take very self-reflecting Psalms. He acknowledges his own sins and iniquities, and he brings them before God, begging for forgiveness. 
But here, David seems to spend so much time criticizing others, that long description of how wicked people are and what they're like. And he analyzes what they do wrong. And yet it doesn't seem to be a balance. He doesn't seem to offer what are the qualities that make someone righteous. He just seems to be kind of bigging himself up almost. He says, but I, by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence, I bow down towards your holy temple. Good for you, David. Aren't you great? Except actually, when we look at that verse again, we see that it's not David that's great. He does, in fact, hit the nail on the head when it comes to identifying what makes a righteous person. It says, but by your great love. It's not anything we can do. It's something only God can do. We are made righteous because of his great love, not by our own great endeavours. Righteousness is the quality of being right in the eyes of God. This means what we do, what we think, what we say, how we act. Righteousness is based on God's standard. And therefore, we will always fall short of this standard. But the forgiveness of sins through faith and the willingness and desire to obey God as king of our lives are what leads us to be called righteous people. Reading a psalm like this one can tell us more than we might think about our relationship with God. You know, we could be surrounded by people who are not pleasant to be around. People who are unkind, thoughtless, selfish, greedy, unwilling to listen to others. Or we could very easily see ourselves as set apart from that group of people. More worthy of them just because we're Christians. We go to church each Sunday. But righteousness is not an automatic quality of simply being someone who comes to church and calls themselves a Christian. It's only receivable through God's love and his forgiveness of our sins. Psalms like this, which we may well use to turn to in times of despair, or when we're feeling persecuted or treated unfairly, they will bring a challenge to us to live a righteous life. One that acknowledges that we are no more worthy than the most wicked people around us, but that we do have hope in salvation from and through God. As you come to the end of the psalm, David brings together these sort of three groups of people that he's involved in the psalm. Himself, the wicked, and the righteous. He asks God to lead him in righteousness and to make straight the way before him. He calls on God to punish the wicked and then brings to a conclusion the psalm almost with a sense of peace, this peace of mind that God does protect his people. It says these words in verses 11 and 12. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. It's joyful, it's reassurance, and perhaps without realising it, David's prayer almost feels like it's answered itself by the time he gets to the end of the psalm. He didn't just pray, but he spent time waiting on God, meditating on God. And he comes to this realisation that refuge, joy and protection, the things he desperately asked for, are found in God. From out of despair, he finds hope and assurance. I myself particularly found myself looking at the end of verse 11. It says that those who love your name may rejoice in you. I wondered, what does it mean to say your name? It's the first occasion in the Psalms where we have this concept of the name of the Lord. And it's much crops up a lot. We hear it said, used in the Bible a lot. And especially in the Psalms, people call on the name of the Lord. We trust in your name, O God, your powerful name. 
And so I thought, this is a good opportunity to try and figure more about the name of the Lord. What is the theological significance of this phrase? It seemed to me that there must be something revelatory rather than just a simple bit of theological language that we just use without really knowing what we mean by it. And so I looked in various Bible commentaries and online to see if there's something profound about calling on the name of the Lord. Is that some specific way that we do it? I f- didn't find anything. And so I reread Psalm 5, trying to sort of make sense. And I saw that the answer is right there at the start. What does it mean to call on God's name? And it's exactly what David does at the start of this psalm. It's what we do when we pray, when we address God, our Lord, our King, our God. We acknowledge the different characteristics of God and how we relate to him. In our sorrow and pain and distress, we call out to him for help. We give thanks to him with grateful hearts. We praise him with joyful minds and happy voices, depending on how we're doing in our lives. How the psalmists, how we address God when we call on his name tells us something of the nature of God as we acknowledge his greatness and his sovereignty over our lives. Our God, the God. No, it's not a God who. I'm not saying our God is a God who does this, as if we're acknowledging there are other gods. No, he is God. God is God. Who is a prayer? Who is prayer hearing God? Who is caring God? Just God, powerful God, Creator God, forgiving God, gracious God, loving God. God is love. The Psalms are one of the best ways I feel of preparing ourselves when we talk to God. When you're you're spending time to pray, why not read a psalm first to inspire you? We can find many lists of the specific psalms that might be useful when you're feeling in a certain way, when you want to give thanks, when you want to say sorry. And it can be a really eye-opening experience. The psalms are a tool like no other. And if I could encourage you to do one thing, it would be using them to really encounter God in your life, in your prayer life and in your daily life. And maybe later today when you get home, take a moment to read a psalm. It could be this one. It could be any of the other ones we've been looking at or we will look at later uh, in this preaching program. But read the psalm and read it for yourself. By all means, get directed towards a particular psalm that might be useful in a certain way you're feeling. But then don't try and analyze and study it with the help of a concordance but read it for yourself like the first, like i did the first time i read it for this talk without anyone else telling you what it means or what you should try and get from it read it and ask yourself what is this telling me about god how does it relate to me how am i encountering god in this wonderful part of the bible And then use the psalm to encounter God in your own personal way through prayer.